Okay, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at some of the ideas from assignment 9.1. So here's a question for you. Which of the following are considered environmental services provided by the atmosphere? Go ahead and pause. All right, let's take a look at your answers. It is A, B, D, and E. The atmosphere absorbs UV radiation by the stratospheric ozone layer. Meteors burn up by air friction, and D, it transports water molecules from one part of the globe to another, and it moderates climate, climate via the greenhouse, gas, greenhouse effect using greenhouse gases. Without the greenhouse effect, it would get extremely cold at night as the heat would radiate out into space without being captured and re-emitted back to the surface. Here's another question for you. Which of the following best represents the composition of the atmosphere? Go ahead and pause. Welcome back. So 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, and then very little of carbon dioxide. We can see in this graph that water vapor is about 2%. Carbon dioxide, very, very small, even though we know it has the biggest effect as a greenhouse gas. Methane is also a greenhouse um, gas, but it is in much smaller concentrations. And then you can see pollutants are mostly in trace quantities. Another question for you, Aurora Borealis, AKA Northern Lights, is caused by light given off by highly energized ionized gas molecules. Which part of the atmosphere is this most likely to occur in? Pause. All right, welcome back. If you said the thermosphere, that is correct. It is the atmosphere that is farthest from the surface, closest to space. So these charged particles come in from the sun and when they go into the atmosphere, they energize the molecules, making them glow. And I want to point out here too that airplanes fly just um, above the troposphere, so they're in the lower stratosphere. We can see the ozone concentration is in the stratosphere, and we also can see maybe some presence of the tropospheric ozone from um, car emissions, primarily. And so here's just a little summary of these different layers. You should take a look at them, read them, perhaps pause. And let's go to the next part here about atmospheric pressure. This means the weight per unit area of air being pulled down by gravity. It's less at higher altitudes. And um, staying on that for a moment there, when we're at sea level, like we are at San Marcos, our skin has about 15 pounds of air pressure pushing against it on every square inch. So that's quite a bit of pressure on our entire body. Relative humidity, this is the ratio of water vapor that the air contains relative to how much it could contain at that temperature. So as air gets warmer, it can hold more water vapor. And at the temperature, as the temperature cools at night, um, the amount of water vapor that the air can hold is less. And if the temperature gets too cold, you will actually have some water vapor condensing into onto grass, which we call dew. And of course, temperature, that's pretty easy, but we should recognize that it varies with altitude, meaning elevation above sea level, location, and time of day. Here's a little diagram as we talk about um, altitude and air pressure. You can see air molecules are very far apart in the upper atmosphere, and they get exponentially more densely packed together as you go down. If you were um, at the top of Mount Everest, you're looking at, um, let's see here, you're looking at it being above, I'm just kind of estimating it, you're above about 67% or so maybe of the air molecules. At this elevation, a little bit below the top of Mount Everest, or quite a bit below, you are above half the air molecules um, in the atmosphere. All right, so the science behind climate, let's take a look at that. We should recognize the difference between weather and climate. Weather is the day-to-day, -day. climate is the year-to-year um, the -year or decade-to-decade -decade or even millennia-to-millennia -millennia over long periods of time. Oh yeah, climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. That's another way of putting it. I didn't say that, Mark Twain did. We should also consider that what makes the seasons, they're a big part of what we, of um, the, the um, weather that we experience. 
So one big thing is the concentration of sunlight hitting us. If the sun is more directly overhead, like if you were to look straight up and it's right over your head, you are getting rays that are most concentrated. If you are um, looking up at, this, at the sun and this lower in the sky, then the rays are going through more atmosphere to get to you, and that's one reason that they're less intense. And the other is that they're being spread out over a larger area and kind of like holding a flashlight at an angle. So the sunlight is also less intense in that way. And we can say that this, so here's just a summary of those ideas. If you want to pause and read that, you should. The other thing that determines our seasons, um, well, this is actually staying on the same topic about the tilt. Just showing you how the planet goes around the sun, it's always tilted the same orientation. It would take somebody like Atlas, if you will, or God, if you will, or some other meteor, I guess, striking Earth or something like that to actually make the axis change. But it's always tilting the same way, give or take. We'll talk more about that when we um, talk about climate change. So um, when the northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun, it is on, on the day that it's most pointed towards it, it's June solstice. And so that's the first day of summer. And then three months later, we're at the March, um, sorry, three months later going this way, we're at the September equinox, the fall equinox. Every place on the planet is getting equal day, equal night on that day. Three months later, we're in the December solstice, first day of winter. And now our hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And then three months later in March, we have our spring equinox. Again, every location on the planet is getting equal day and equal night. And that's the first day of spring. What type of weather does a low pressure system bring? Go ahead and make your choice. All right, if you said rainy and overcast, you are correct. Let's take a look at why that is. Low pressure means that the air is rising. And as it rises, it cools. As it cools, the water vapor condenses into clouds. And if those droplets get big enough, it rains. The opposite is for high pressure. It's hot, dry weather. So my next question, what type of biome is found along the equator? It is the rainforest. So because the air is rising, expanding, gases, low pressure system, deserts, if we go back to this question here, the last slide, deserts are found um, next to the equator. As the air comes down, it's becoming pressurized and it is therefore heating up and it's dry because it already lost its moisture. So we can say here, desert, these are found above and below the equator because of sinking, compressing gases, causing high pressure systems. We can see that also equator right here, rainforest, Amazon rainforest, African rainforest, um, South Pacific rainforest. And then just above that at 20 degrees latitude, we see the Saharan desert, Middle Eastern desert, Mexican desert. 20 degrees south, we see South African desert, the Australian desert, which we call the outback. And I guess these would be the, um, the Andes desert maybe. And we talk about these big giant convection currents being called cells. And um, here's a diagram for that. The cells that are along the equator like this are called the Hadley cells. Further up north are called the feral cells. And then we have the polar cells. Not a big deal here, but just notice how they work like gears. Um, if you remember some toy you may have played with as a kid, these two sections have to be uh, moving the same way. Or I guess you could say they have to be doing the opposite. This is um, counterclockwise, the other one is clockwise, so that they kind of meet and mesh together. You can see that meshing more easily right here, perhaps. All right, so the sun drives weather in the troposphere. We've kind of talked about this idea already, so I'm just going to say pause and look over it if you want to. Which of the following atmospheric processes results in the rain shadow effect? Pause. All right, welcome back. So if you said rising air becomes cooler, that's part of it. And the colder the air, the colder the air is, the less water vapor it can hold. So that's the other part of it. And we had this diagram. This would be like the Santa Barbara Mountains. This could be the sea. We could have um, storm weather coming in along here. And as that air gets hits the mountainside, it gets deflected because it can't go through the mountain. So it's getting pushed up. And as it gets pushed up, it's getting colder. As it gets colder, the vapor condenses, droplets form. 
So by the time the clouds or the air has gotten over the top, now the moisture is gone and now the air is getting blown down. So it's getting compressed and that has the effect of heating it up. And so the rain shadow is always to the east of, um, in, at least in our, on our planet, where the wind generally blows from west to east. We find the rain shadows on the eastern side of mountains. And we see that uh, along here, these are the Sierra Nevadas. And then next to it, we get the Nevada Desert. We see it here. This, this is the, um, these are the Rocky Mountains. Denver is like right here. And then you get this area where you're not getting a whole lot of rain, where it seems to be a little bit more brownish. Following a volcanic eruption in Hawaii, which way would the ash and smoke most likely blow? All right, so did you say west? If you did, that's correct. These winds near the equator are called the trade winds. Winds north of positive 30 degrees latitude and south of negative 30 degrees latitude blow to the east. Um, and blowing to the east, those are actually called westerlies, meaning they are from the west. And so we can see that diagram with here. Along the equator, winds are blowing from the east to the west. We call them the trade winds. I don't know why they're not called the easterlies. But when we go further north or further south, we get into the westerlies. And you can notice here the rotation of the Earth, and that's actually what really determines the direction of this wind. Earth is rotating to the right, um, and because of the inertia of the air, and I think this is a correct way to think about it, using my physics mind, the air kind of has some inertia. So the Earth is spinning, and then the air is um, kind of resisting going with it. Um, the deflection that we're seeing here, um, just the fact that these are not going straight, they're kind of deflecting, it's called the Coriolis effect. Not a big deal, but maybe be able to recognize that. And a little refresher here about El Nino. So those trade winds that we were talking about, they're responsible for the upwelling that we see labeled here, and that's bringing nutrient-rich water off the coast of Peru really good for the algae, therefore really good for the fish, therefore really good for the fishermen. And on, um, non, during an El Nino year, either these winds stop, die down, or they blow the opposite way. And that means you don't get the, the, the upwelling. So the deep cold water stays below the surface. But you can also see here that this water is now warmer, so you're getting more evaporation, which is creating stronger storms and you can get some pretty massive erosion happening in Peru. And this effect even reaches us, reaches us up in California.